episode of the Developers Den podcast where we talk about everything in the games industry between the eyes of indie devs. Uh, my name is Siavash, aka Rainy, and my co-host is Sydney, aka Femme. And today we are lucky enough to have another guest, our second guest of the podcast, and it's Jason from the Gentleman Rat, Rat Studios, the people behind Critico. So if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself, say hi to everybody, please go ahead. Hi. Um... I am uh, one of the lead developers on Critter Cove and very happy to be here. Um, we've known you guys for quite a while, actually, and yeah. been talking for, I, how long has it been? Has it been a couple Three years? years? Three, four Three years, years, yeah. God, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's been quite a long time. Yeah, no, yeah, we, thank you for joining us. Yeah. We found you guys um, through <laughs> the, the person that links us all through Dr. D-Dub. Oh, yeah. I remember because he i think was testing your game i think he did yep. like a a stream of it or something and i don't remember if i reached that out to you it. if yeah, you reached out to us or that, what yeah. it was but that's how i found you guys mm. um i don't know how you found out about us but yeah it's it's funny that we're all either like through kickstarter or <laughs> through dr d dub is how we all like know each other um, yeah, that was such a long time ago. Yeah. I do remember looking at a version of the game. Yeah. Which looks pretty different to how the game does now, Critical I mean. Um, and back then, Doc was like looking at uh, one of the very early versions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys were still running your own engine at that point, or was it the Unity? Um, but yeah, that was like three years ago. Maybe. Yeah, yeah no. We're, yeah, we, we were still on Unity. So um, we've been on Unity the whole time, um, for good or bad. You know, it's. <laughs> Yeah. There, there was that moment uh, a little bit last year when you're like, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it, oh, it yeah, 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 with the out. Unity thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, now I remember, yeah. yeah. There's so, been so many Unity things, it's kind of hard to keep track. <laughs> right, right. Um, but for, for anybody who doesn't know, do you want to talk about your game real quick, Critter Cove, what it is, what it's about, when it's coming sure. out, all that sure. stuff? Yeah. Uh, Critter Cove is a open world sim, basically. It's in the cozy genre, so uh, it's easy to get into, easy to play, fun. Um, again, that's, you know, why we know you guys is, is we're all, the cozy community kind of knows yeah. everybody in the cozy community and we all yeah. talk and chat. Um, it's a very uh, relaxing, fun game. Um, our take on it that's a little different than, than most people's is we're heavily into exploration, ocean, swimming, diving, um, exploring. Uh, that's kind of the big difference for us is we wanted to do um, a game. You know, we inspire things from like Animal Crossing, My Time with Portia, um, you know, Stardew Valley. We're 3D, but, um, you know, these, these games all play somewhat similarly. But the one thing we've always wanted to do and we felt restricted in playing some of these games is I, I want to see more. I want to go out into the world and, and explore a little bit more. Um, and these games are usually really, really focused. Um, and then we discovered a reason why that was. <laughs> God, is that insane? <laughs> you know, we had we a lot of exploration <laughs> at some point in Sunnyside, yeah, believe it or not. We did. And yeah. then we even we even dabbled with voxels at some point. Yeah. And we were like, nope, nope, this is way too much. We're just yeah. gonna stick to our landscapes and no, no ocean, ocean. Yeah. It's funny because I always go back to a, a kind of you, you know I don't know if you I don't think you've watched any of our podcasts, but this whole series has been kind of how to be an indie developer, how to make games, from starting a business to what we're working on now is how do you get started with actually making the game. And the thing that I always go back to is this general warning of it's really easy to have good ideas. The good ideas are the, the idea easiest guy. part. And the, it's so like, you know, especially now that like our game is out, we have, you know, people are giving us really good ideas. And I, I often feel bad being like, we've already thought of that. The reason we didn't do it is because making it's really hard <laughs> right. and so yeah we did the same thing where we're like you know we wanted to have save any time and we were yeah. like why has nobody done this in the farm genre why is it and then we tried to do it went oh that's why <laughs> it just uh, so player was the one for us you know it's it's you guys have what's great and i really wish we had it um it, it's no it's we don't have multiplayer not yet not yet? Oh. No, not yet. 
a oh, challenge that, that I'm not looking yeah. forward to. Yeah. It's brutal. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's it's if you don't do it from day one, it's 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 just brutal. So, uh, you know, those are the kind of things though that you you just go well. Something's got to give. Like you you mm. can't do it all. Um, you know, we're not AAA studios, and and that's part of the problem with I think the industry yep. right now are the demands on indie devs is constantly you know this we used to be separate like you know indie devs were looked at i think a little differently and given a little bit more leeway you could be more focused yeah. that, that seems to blurred a lot um i don't know if it is getting back to like the engines and the fidelity that you can reach now as an indie yeah. dev um getting it closer and closer is almost detrimental now though like yeah the closer your game gets to double a or triple a the more is expected and yeah. and even though you're like hey we're just three guys in a in a broom closet trying to make a yeah. game they're gonna have to intentionally um, downgrade it at some point especially visually yeah, because well, people right? judge that so quickly i mean yeah. we've had similar we've definitely had those issues of not even just just game scope or game mechanics but people not really understanding that there are things that triple a studios have access to that we just don't so, you know, people asking, they wanted to pre-order the game on Steam. That's not an option for indie games. Or um, there was, what was the other thing? Oh, the other day people were asking about um, Twitch, like, releases. Like, specific things that we release on Twitch that's, oh, like, something that... Oh, drops and stuff, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's not something that indie games do. That's a AAA game thing. Or wanting higher fidelity graphics, which, again, yeah, we can do it, but it's going to take us longer and it's going to cost us more money. And so it's like, there's all these things that people have gotten used to from AAA games. And then for us, because our game looks polished, I guess, just visually because of the art style and stuff, it takes the expectation from like, you know, pixel indie game to, oh, well, you look like a AAA game. So you have to have all these other things too. Mm. And right. I imagine you guys are going to have the same exact problem because your game looks really yeah, polished too. Yeah, you're in the club too. of... 3D indie games, yeah. and that doesn't have the pixelated art style of the yeah. super stylized, cell shaded filter over it. And as soon as you don't have those two criteria, I feel like immediately people just yeah. judge you very differently. I especially noticed that with pixel art games versus just three games, there's just an immediate kind of change in how. Yeah. Which is crazy because I mean, I mean, the 3D is so much harder. <laughs> yeah, so I think if the if the series is about like new new people coming in and wanting to develop games, um, that's it's in a very abstract concept, but it's yeah. something to be aware of. Is like you may not want to push your fidelity as high as you, but even if you can reach that, yeah. you may not want to do it for for you know impression reasons, um, you know because you're going to be put into a category that is the expectations get risen. Um, uh, but but coming back to the focus. Uh, I don't think there's a single thing we did on Critter Cove that I would recommend any indie dev do. <laughs> same like, for us. You know... <laughs> we say the exact we're, same thing. <laughs> we're, we're definitely in the do as I say, yeah. not as we did category. Please learn from all our all of our mistakes yeah. and all the things that we did that didn't work. Please don't do them. It it was not good. And <laughs> please learn from our our own issues and don't make them yourself. Unless you want to learn from your mistakes, in which case, go for it. But we don't yeah. recommend it. So so this is Critter Cove is is um your guys' studio's first game, right? But No, actually, it's um it's basically our we'll say our third game. Okay. Um, the first two were actually uh, mobile titles. Mm. Right. Um, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And and so that's where we, it. Yeah, because we wanted to ask yeah. about your background and where you kind of yeah the game development in general. Because you guys were in games longer than that, right? All of you guys. Uh, not all of us. I wasn't, okay. but my my younger brother and uh, his significant long term other is also in game development. She's an artist. He's a mm. game designer. They've worked for 20 years. I think mm. he originally got started in, they both got started in EverQuest um, as I think it was, um, uh, I think she was an artist and, and he was a uh, um, mod. And then okay. he got into game design through that. And then they ended up 
getting on Star Wars Galaxies and a whole slew of mobile titles. So they, their credentials are pretty good. They've, they've been mm. doing it a long time. Actually, I have a here, hold it up. So this is one of my. Oh, that's oh, cool. Nice. That is really cool. That's cool. So we got everybody to sign it at the studio. And, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so they, so that's where they're from. So they they actually know games and, and have designed and built games, and hopefully that shows in our game. Mm. Um, me though, as the, the software side of things, um, I came from industry. So I think right. my last job was director at CoStar, which is a large commercial real estate um, data mining company. So mm. that's where I cut my teeth was was building um, back end software systems for for large banks and things like that. Um, so after, after we've doing that for 30 years, I was pretty burned out on it. It's very samey. You know, it's funny about software development. Almost every job outside of games, honestly, and maybe getting into like education, um, it's the same. Like you can take your skill set. It doesn't matter who you work for. It could be bank, Facebook, whatever. Um, and it all just translates. Like you're yeah. just, you're just manipulating data. Um, so it's it's it, it gets a little same. And then you come over to games and you're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't like, do this. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, I remember we had a, a guy pop into our, our discord the other day and was asking about all these, you know, in, what kind of infrastructure stuff do you use and, and full stack and throwing around terms I'd never heard of before. And I had to go pull my software engineer boyfriend over and be like, what's he talking about? <laughs> Cause he had to be like, no, no, it's completely different. Like, yeah, we're technically creating software, but none of it translates. The only thing maybe is source control, maybe, you know, right. but, um, but yeah, I thought that was an interesting, like, it, it seems like yeah. it would be a nice easy hop, but it's really not. It's a totally different ball game. Yeah, we've been, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been developing games for almost 10 years. So, mm -hmm. or now actually 10 years this year. So that's awesome. But it's taken us that long to really get good at the job. Like, I yeah. only think in the last year or two, I would I would consider us now fully like, okay, we're, we're a solid studio. We know what we're doing fully. We've learned our mistakes. And, yeah. you know, now we're, we're just... I think, and I think that's true of anything though, whether you're a cellist or, or whatever. I, yeah. I think it takes about 10 years or so to really get to be an expert at what you do. Um, I think we're yeah. finally at the point, Rainy and I, where we've like accepted the fact that we're game developers. Cause it, we definitely lived in, in um, what's that, the phrase, um, imposter syndrome for yeah. about two years. Of just like it's it's a, it's a funny balance because um yeah. in one in one side of it I'm like okay what is the criteria for you to call yourself a member mm -hmm. of the game in the games industry uh, a developer a full on developer and then at the other side I'm like well like every month I'm learning so much new stuff that I go back and judge what I've done in the past heavily yeah like. It, it, we don't even have to go back like two three years for me to be like oh this code was pretty bad and now i can do it a million times better with so many new features it's uh, i don't know if it's just a, a fact of software development or especially games because of just how many different fields you touch from art to music to to uh, technical art to then programming um or if it's really in any field where you find this improvement at that speed um just just being able to fiddle with ideas and and like you said data manipulation i feel like the games industry especially is an area where it's the most experimental so it's like like you said as well with the sameness of being a software development i feel like it when you're a game dev especially if you're working in indie which means you're full stack um there's a lot more um potential for you to jump around so you don't get bored you don't get as burnt out if you get bored of working on the same system for a very long time you can just always hop on a complete an area yeah. <laughs> or system and just work on that but that is that is something in the games industry that i love is that um growing up i was like do i want to be a film director do i want to be a programmer and i was like wait game development is like all of those things all of it yeah so that's yeah yeah that's 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 like why my, my one thing for really liking the game um games industry so where i'm going with this is that 
for you to change your career and focus on uh, game development, was that a criteria for you? What was the reason that you decided to jump on this game development quickly? It's definitely something that, you know, we've grown up playing games. You know, we love games. Um, it's been part of our life and uh, always had that desire, um, but just never had the opportunity. So once, once my brother and um, his girlfriend were <clears throat> kind of at a point where they, they wanted to do that, and I was at a point and just kind of lined up where um, I just kind of gotten through what I needed to get through professionally. So I just like, okay, I'm at a good spot. They're at a good spot to try something on our own. Um, and and so we just decided, hey, you know, life is short, and and you gotta you gotta move. So, you know, we're a little different than I think a lot of indie developers. Um, a lot of indie developers, you know, in their twenties, you know, they, you know, live in a six people in a house and do whatever they need to do to survive. <laughs> so they're they're learning and growing and and you know that that chaos of being young. Um whereas we're all, you know, in our fifties and late forties. So I think I agree that it now. it used to be that way for sure. But I think the I think COVID kind of changed all of that. Because if especially if you look at a lot of these in like for instance if you look at Singularity Six they were all from AAA companies, and then Ooh. they left their oh, companies, came together. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot more of that, I feel like, happening in the indie space, which is you have a lot of veteran game developers who are looking at these AAA studios going, this isn't satisfying, I'm not allowed to be as creative as I want, and they're going out and putting together studios and trying to find funding. And the thing is that I've found really interesting is there's kind of this expectation that because they're coming from AAA, they're automatically going to succeed. And now that it's been a few years, you're watching them all kind of not. You know, Singularity 6 just got purchased. There's yep. a few other games that have gotten a couple years deep and been like, no, this isn't working. We're going to cancel this project. So and it makes a lot of sense It's been really interesting to watch. Veterans move because I feel like as much as um, the games industry is so volatile right now, and as, as much as hardship we have, at the same time, when it comes to the types of games that people play and are um, responsive to, um, we're at a time where you can almost do anything and people will play it. You will find yeah. a community that find it very compelling and will play it. Because, uh, God, do you guys remember the 2010s? Um, between 2008 to 2011, where everything was a first-person shooter, everything had that yeah. gray, yellowish tint over it. And any time you tried to kind of break out of that mold, you would either really break it at that 1%, but most of the time people would just not play the game or say, oh, that's for kids, or, oh, I'm, mm. I'm, not, I'm not going to try that game because it's experimental for me. But now I feel like, yeah, people are a lot more open to just try experimental ideas. I mean, look at Lethal Company, for example. That, yeah. that game really did well. And then another one with uh, Rust's Retirement. The desktop toys are coming back. I do remember yeah, the days right. of Bonzi Buddy and stuff, and now it's kind of right. coming back with actual good games from indie. So, yeah, it makes sense why they would move because uh, AAA is a lot more careful with where they go with their experiments. Well, they're but getting indie, their money from more mainstream sources now. Exactly. So but indie you're is having kind of business like people. this area where you can really go and experiment. And yeah. Fun. Well, yeah. speaking of uh, experimenting, um, I, I want to uh, kind of get to the topic for oh, yeah. the week, if y'all are cool with that. Yeah. Um, and so what we want to talk about, and the reason we asked you to join us, is because we want to talk about game engines. Um, I think a lot of new time developers or people who want to be developers don't really know where to start. Kind of the first question you have to ask yourself is, well, what can I make and where can I make it? And so we kind of want to talk about, you know, what are your options? Um, what's out there? What's easy to access? How can you play with it? You know, what are your needs? Kind of that thing. Uh, Rainy and I have experience with Unreal. Um, you have experience with Unity, which we absolutely don't. We don't know anything about Unity. <laughs> um, and then uh, just kind of talk about, are there other things other than the, the two big dogs? Um, Godot or Godot. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it. Uh, I say Godot because Godot sounds funny to me. Um, but that one's coming up as kind of a, a new option for people. There's some other mainstays that people have been using for a long time. So, um, yeah. So, But before we get into that, though, I think it's yeah. a better ramp if we talk about <clears throat> a, not a simpler decision, but it's like two choices. 
And that's mm. whether you want to create your own engine or go with something off the shelf, like Unreal Unit, you know. Um, so um, when you guys uh, started working on Critical specifically, um, how did that process go for you? Did you guys from the start work in Unity? Did you try to experiment with, uh, with your own engine? And what do you suggest the criteria are to want to make your own engine? Because that's such a money. Yeah. Um... My, my background uh, is I'm a big believer in engines um, and I'm also a big believer in layering your own engines on top of engines. So it, I, I think you need infrastructure no matter how big you are or how small you are. And it's funny, you hear that a lot. Well, I'm small, I can, you know, I can just do. It's like if you're small, you actually need to be more, you know, heavily invested into infrastructure. and. And what we can, I, we can talk about exactly what that means in a minute. Um, but it's it's basically because you have less resources, um, which means you need to build things in a way that are reusable, that are, right. you know, you, you can make changes faster. You actually need to be more disciplined because there's only one of you or two of you or three of you. Um, so code and, and these, these whole things can get out of hand very rapidly. Um, to the point where it's just spaghetti and you you have absolutely no idea how to fix anything, how to fix bugs, whatever. It's just everything you touch breaks something else. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm and luckily I had that 30 years of background of, of discipline, you know, um, software development to kind of rely on. So I used that, leveraged that, and I looked around and go, okay, you know, in, in our companies before this, you know, in my previous life, um, we built on top of various engines, you know, whether it be you know, various forms of .NET um, uh, using Agile and all that kind of stuff. So um, they're, they're, you always use as much as you possibly can what else has been created for you. Um, because game development is hard enough to do without you then building a bunch of stuff from scratch. Um, honestly, the, these teams have been doing a lot longer than you. They're better than you. <laughs> They've had more experience than you. More resources, um, more resources than you. Uh, I would say, for most of you, don't do it. There, there is, you know. But if you want to, because that you want to explore that, you know, fine. Um, but it's, I, I would almost say you're looking at more as a hobby than you are as a business at that point, because it's, it's not really a good business decision, unless like. There are certain certain side cases to that. Like, there are certain things that, you know, some of these engines may just, you know, you you have a very specific use case that you want to build off of. Um, I haven't I haven't actually looked into it much, but you had mentioned um, one of the games that's on the desktop now. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe you know this yeah. pixel level. Maybe there was certain things that you know I I don't know what he used there or she was used the there. It, it was yeah. Unity. Yeah. So you can use Unity for it. Well, I could have saw that it maybe being something custom somebody, you know, built because of it had a specific yeah. case for it. Um, but in general, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I don't want to be like, <laughs> Doug, you know, the, the naysayer or anything like yeah. that. Um, since we brought in here to talk about this, but I would say don't flat out just don't do it. I think it's you're up to like three, you know, go dot. Unreal or Unity. I mean, yeah. those are those are the three biggies. Yeah. Um, I mean, if if I may be so bold. I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Right. Oh I'm no, I, I was just going to say, um, yeah, but specifically why we chose Unity. Uh, C Sharp is is for GL language is a lot easier to use than C plus mm plus. -hmm. Um, that was a decision for me. I I was more comfortable in C Sharp. Uh, so I had less of a learning curve. Um, right. Unreal had definite advantages outside of that, but that was a big one for me. Um, I think there's a little... <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's, and, uh, that's <laughs> yeah, we, I think we live fairly close to a uh, uh, emergency, you know, mm. they call them the deers there. So they're the ambulance drivers. So right. We have uh, so, yeah. around this time always the ice cream truck go by. 
but but your answer <laughs> to the to the custom engine is pretty much um, what I heard. Uh, th this is you, uh, not a YouTuber really, but his YouTube shorts and TikToks have been going pretty crazy recently. His name's uh, his username is Pirate Software. I don't know if you've Pirate seen him in a while, uh, but um, he pretty much gave a pretty similar answer to you. Whether one, if you really like doing it, sure, go for it, but that has to be your focus. Or two, you have a super specific use case for it. Like I can see, for example, with physics, right? Most of the time, just physics is going to work with, you know, the physics with the P, H, uh, X at the end. Um, that plugin is going to work for you. In, and it's embedded into Unity, it's embedded into Unreal, it's embedded into Godot. All of those have it. Unless you're trying to make a crazy gravity-focused yeah. game, that then that is not going to come in and work for you. Then sure, go for it. But most of the time, the off-the-shelf engines, like you said, they've solved these problems way before you with tons more yeah. people, with tons more QA, and tons of games have been built using these systems that you might not even notice they're using these, these tiny systems in older mechanics. But if I may be so bold to say, there's like this elitist group of people who think you have to make your own engine and if you yeah. use an off-the-shelf engine then you're, you're not, not a game developer enough. you're not a game developer yeah. so that is that is definitely the Just wrong crazy. mindset i think um but creating your own en engine is is not a bad idea i mean we wouldn't have unity or godot otherwise everything would be unreal um but at the same time, you have to consider that. And uh, like you said, it becomes a full-time job just working on the yeah. engine. I've seen so many uh, YouTubers that started um, videoing their journey of making their own engine. And uh, most of the time you can see it just kind of fizzles out and they just give up on the game too because the engine just becomes way too much to handle. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's be clear here, there are so much that these these engines don't do yet you know there's 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 still so many things that you have to build system wise on top of these engines um for these games as you, as you guys well know yeah. um you know you you have just just the simplest thing of well how am i going to get my data into the game for let's say leveling purposes and um, you know, things like uh, growth charts and weather yep. forecasting and when is it rain, when is it not? I mean, all this has to be built still, um, putting aside. So so don't take on, you know, low level graphic issues, trying to build everything. I mean, you are going to be plenty busy solving mammoth problems um, about just how your game works. Uh, we we, need a we had to build to make a renderer just focus on the game yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean you, you'll have plenty to do <laughs> and yeah. you'll have to be really creative about it um you know to optimize it effectively to to do whatever I mean, we we put a lot of effort into building for instance um our ai so what we built was uh, we needed conversation and behavioral system um, and that's where we spent a huge chunk of our resources because we knew we had a lot of characters. We wanted them to do some pretty crazy, funky things. Um, and and I read an article, um, and I oh, kicking myself for not dr digging this out first because I, I could give you his name. Maybe I'll pass that along to you so for the rest of people can look at it afterwards. Yeah. yeah. But um, he, he basically kind of gave us idea of of how to use more or less a SQL um, oriented uh, uh, lookup system um, in order to to decide how things should should work at the AI. So that's what we did. So if you kind of look at how we make our decisions, um, it's all using uh, an SQL language, uh, which is like a database query language. Yeah. So you okay. can do things like, you know, create facts. Everything in our world is a fact. So with if it's if it's raining, mm -hmm. that's a fact, and you can look that up. I can write, hey, I can write a rule that just basically says if it's raining and it's twelve o'clock, and you know you've done this quest before, then execute this, and it's all done in this higher level, not even in C sharp, but it's all done at the SQL level, so that you can have um, game designers just go into a little editor, create rules and then associate behaviors to them to say, okay, now execute this. Um, and it's been, you know, a godsend because, again, you, you, you're trying to take advantage of 
um, the minimal resources that you have. And so you want yeah. it to be as efficient as possible and as easy as possible. It's similar to how we've done a lot of stuff for Sunnyside in that, you know, Rainy will put together the general tools of the systems and then I can go in behind him and adjust the actual data itself. And <clears throat> which is frankly the part that he finds to be the most boring. So, <laughs> yeah. so, or even better, you know, I can do all the planning on a spreadsheet on Google Docs, and then yep. we just import the spreadsheet, and the sp and it just populates everything that we need. And if we need files. to adjust it, yeah, if we need to adjust it, I can adjust it on the Google Sheet, and then he just re-imports it, and, and we're good to go. So That's exactly what we do. And yeah, we it have, makes it a lot all easier. Google Doc sheets yep. and our ability to just import them in, whether it's dialogue. It also, yeah, boom. it also makes balancing so much easier, you know, because Excel will, not Excel, but Google Sheets will do, you know, if you need math or you can, you know, quickly change hundreds awesome. of rows of something or you can do, gra yeah, so, um, yeah, definitely, uh, I highly recommend uh, doing stuff on Sheets and importing it. Um, one of the lessons that we learned is you really shouldn't be inputting a lot of data directly into the engine. Yes. Um, it just, Whatever. you're going to run into so many errors, especially if you're trying to do, you shouldn't be typing anything into the data, it's the stuff in the engine. You shouldn't be, you know, it should all be pulling from string sheets and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, and that's kind of the benefit of using these engines is they kind of, you know, you have that framework. Your programmer, in our case, Rainy, in your guys' case, you can kind of build off of that. Honestly, and then you can guidance, have the designers. Right? Because yeah. if you don't have, uh, th this kind of goes into a different discussion. I don't want to change the subject at all, but uh, just to kind of grab a paper from it. Um, and it's the fact that limitation breeds creativity, right? So sometimes the limitation of the engine it's that our you motto. have, <laughs> it does actually kind of gives you, like you said, the framework, the infrastructure of then building upon it. Because if you if you're just staring at a command line or just an editor like a text editor with, like with where do you limitless start? possibilities, yeah, yeah, great, you can do whatever you want. But at the same time, where are you even gonna start? So that kind of working off of an engine, working off of the instructions, and even the limitations of the engine, does kind of push you to be more creative to try to find solutions within. Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, you, you got to decide what you are. Are you a hobbyist, or, or, or are you are you an indie dev who's, who's doing this professionally? And you got to make yeah. business decisions. And some of those is you're limited in resources and time. Yeah. And so if you can save a resource and time by saying, okay, something is eighty percent or ninety percent good enough, you you got to take that and move on um, because there's too much work to do. You know, the, yeah. there's always more. So. Um, yeah, and, and to your point, it just kind of frees you, frees your mind up to go. Okay, well, here's here's the boundaries of what I have to work with. Now I can just kind of focus on you know within those parameters on on what I need to to accomplish and come up with a solution. Because there's always solutions. I mean, yeah, and I've heard that too. Is that if you use Unreal or you as especially with Unity a lot more. Um, it's it's. They're like, oh, they all look the same, or it's just that, or you know, whatever, cookie cutter, et cetera. And I'm, I'm like, you're, no, you're just, you're limited not yeah. by the engine ultimately, you're, you, you're limited by your own creativity off of the engine. So, pretty much, yeah. Um, there's a lot you can do. So. And we, we've talked about in previous episodes the kind of, you know, how do you kind of get started, really? And the general advice that we've kind of given to, anybody out there who's looking to get into this is is start small start with something tiny start for yourself start with you know a, a simple a platformer or you know something whatever and at that point you can kind of choose you know what engines you're comfortable with and that's your time for experimenting and stuff you don't want to start with the immediate goal of okay i'm a business i'm gonna make money you need to start first with i need to establish what i am as a game designer, developer, programmer, whatever. And then from there, you can work towards the goal of selling your games for money. If you start with the idea right out the gate of, I'm going to do this as a business, I'm going to make money, you're putting so much more pressure on yourself 
and you know you don't have the freedom to just make games you have to be a marketer you have to be a business owner you have to be all these other things to make it work whereas when you're making a game that requires so much focus and energy and creativity that you really don't have the space to do all those other things too right out the gate so it's kind of if you can use an engine that takes one more thing off your plate in those first steps you have that room to now be creative so the question really is when you start what engine do you choose which one's going to work best for you and how do you know the difference and i think the the benefit is they're all most of them are free so you can kind of dabble in everything and see what's right for you and despite what i think the rest of the industry wants to say there is no right answer they're all viable you know you just have to test them and and see what works and so i guess i kind of want to talk about like what are the options we you know we all know unity we all know unreal godot is coming up um in term because godot's early access if i remember not early access open access um open which open source thank you which makes it a lot more appealing funny to enough believe people. it or not i think unreal and unity both are also open because if you go on git with unreal there are tons of folks of it um yeah created with that to be fair it's a lot more strict when it gets to the actual yeah. release of it so godot is like a free open source you can that's that kind of the difference is is yeah. where's your money going and and that's kind of um another thing i want to talk about is what are some of the downsides for using these but um i think some of the other ones that i've i've heard people talk about get kicked around i don't really know a lot but i know there's like rpg maker was a popular mm -hmm. one for a long time game maker i think is also game maker is very viable now actually yeah, uh, yeah. It, uh, game maker um, 2 came out um a few years ago and since that there, there are tons of games that have been made by like tons of really good indie that are... mm. it's especially so good you guys are the games, programmers game maker. what are some other ones that are out there that people can research and and maybe i mean download I'll start, test i'll start by saying that don't worry about having to jump into a big engine from the start if you think an engine isn't viable but it's a but but you feel you understand it better go for it the game i the, the very first game i made uh was when i was 14 i think and it was with rpg maker i made a tiny little rpg wrote some stories figured out how triggers work figured out how um story progression work, story keys and all that work and then i moved to construct and it was construct 2 at the time and I just made some side side scroll shooters and stuff like that. And then at that point, then when I saw the blueprint system, I moved to Unreal. And that was my criteria to wanting to Unreal. But you don't you don't have to start with the big three. Um, if there is a smaller engine for you out there or something that works for you. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, especially if you're just starting, whatever clicks with your brain, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could not agree more with with Rain. It's it's exactly that. Um, I just read an article about working out, and they're they, you know you see all these articles all the time. At least I do, anyways. I guess I'm at that age where they send me these things. <laughs> yeah. Go to the gym more. Go to the gym more. Um, and but it was interesting because you, you hear okay, you know exactly how to train in your weights. You know, is this more effective at building strength? And you know, what if I do five reps instead of three reps? And everybody's constantly trying to adjust this to get perfect. And they finally released this this whole little um, uh, study where they're like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> just work out. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it doesn't matter. It doesn't it, matter. It so doesn't matter at all. You're talking about yeah. percentages of percentages. You know who does the best? Person that shows up and goes to the gym every day. That's <laughs> yeah. who does the best. And yeah. and that, I would use the exact same logic here. It's like whatever your brain clicks with, whatever is easiest for you to get in and start developing is the thing you should use. Yeah. Um, so you know, go play around and 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 back to your point too is as well. Um, if if it's something that um, don't put pressure on yourself. Go explore. If you haven't done this before, find out if you even like doing it. You know, yeah. there's, 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 or what pieces you like doing. Um, but you should play around with it. You're not going to be an expert in a week. You're not going to be an expert in a year. You know, it's going to take you a few years. 
to really get your feet underneath you and, and really understand this. So don't put a lot of pressure on yourself and especially if you're not doing it full time. Um, yeah. So I think the thing is, is use whatever you enjoy most and that you will do consistently. Um, I, and it's I was not that, even, oh, go ahead, sorry, go ahead and finish. I was just, I was my, my poor Portuguese teacher, tutor, <laughs> I'm learning Portuguese and uh, badly. And it's because I don't spend <laughs> enough time doing it. You know, right. and it's like, you got to do it every day. Um, Consistency, I think is the key. Yeah. Consistency. So, and I was, so was going to say that it's not even, you know, yeah, it's going to take you time to learn the engine, but I always come back to making games is still an art form. You're still creating art. And I, I usually liken it to you're basically making a movie but you have to make everything in the movie. You have to make the actors, you have to make the props, you have to make the environment, the cameras, everything. And part of, I think, the the process of the making the game, yes, you have to know how to use the engine, but it's also going to take time to establish what your art style is and, and what kinds of stories you want to tell and how you want to tell them. And that's definitely a process that really shouldn't be rushed either. You know, and you need to find what engine is going to work with your style the best. Whether that's Game Maker, RPG Maker, or Unity, or Unreal, or Godot, or whatever. So, there's a, a actually a really great um, video, maybe we can link it, Rainy, when we, when we put this out. But he, uh, this guy went through and used like the top five or six video game engines and made the same game in every engine. To just to like show, you know, here's all these different things that they can do. Here's what styles that they kind of lean best with and things like that. So, you know, it's not something you have to push hard on. You know, you have to be consistent. You have to test it. But there's no rush, you know. So start early as you can. You know, as soon as you're interested, start testing things. But, you know, you don't have to choose the best thing. You don't have to you know, make the best game. You just have to do something. Like you said, the person who wins is the person who shows up at the gym. The person who's going to make good games is the person who's at least making games. Yeah. Don't let yeah. the, the idea of, you know, oh, it has to be the best game, or I have to make a ton of money, or I have to be an overnight success, or it has to be a smash hit or whatever. Don't let that stop you from putting that foot forward, at least trying and seeing what you can come up with. Yeah, that, that makes me think of this. I was, I was doing some writing years ago. Um, I was interested in, okay, learning about writing and writing and getting involved in that. And I read a book um, by Stephen King on writing, mm. uh, excellent book, but it's to your point of this is art. Um, yeah. But, you know, writers write is what he ultimately stated in that book. He's like, and that's, you want to write, you want to be a writer? Well, writers write. And it's the only way you'll ever get good at it yeah. and learn and, and develop your art form is it by doing. Um, so, and, and it's interesting what you just, what you, what you said there really kind of tied back into what we were saying about, well, whatever fits your head, you know, whatever, whatever your, you know, your brain clicks with, you just summed it up in a more succinct. <laughs> way. That's what I do. <laughs> you know, that was, that was, that was really good. That took our <laughs> floaty words and turned it into reality. That's because so, I'm the writer. <laughs> um, there you go. That's true. Sitting does bring order to the chaos that I create. That's very true. Um, so we, we talked about um, just getting your feet wet. Just uh, start working on the game that you're wanting to work on. Don't worry about engine and stuff like that. So I think it's a good idea to kind of talk about both our experiences and what we suggest to people in terms of where to go to learn. Because, you know, we currently, obviously, we have Discord servers you can go to. Um, <clears throat> we have Udemy and other online websites that have all these courses that you can take. And then we have yeah. YouTube, uh, where you can just go and find videos. For me, yeah. if I just want to start with my own experience, the, I was using Construct at, at the time, and I was going to uni to learn game development. Suffice to say, I didn't learn anything about game development over there. But It's a whole other story. It's a whole other story, <laughs> yeah, we could do a whole episode on it. But uh, I remember it was one day and I was like, I'm tired. I want to learn Unreal. I, I've had enough. I need to learn this thing. Finally. 
uh because i've been wanting to learn it for the longest time and i just opened the video and it was like an hour long video it was like how to make this environment in unreal walk around it and i i remember i had to really push myself but i just sat down and i pushed through the video and i recreated everything at the same time in the engine and that was really that was really it for me once I got there, a lot of the things clicked in my head. It was like, oh, this is how this works. This is how this other thing works. And then after the video was ended, I just kind of spent another three, four hours on that environment, adding my own own, own touches and influences on top of it. And that's how it started for me. So for me, it was YouTube. YouTube was a very good um, resource. Now, I do have a pretty big pet peeve with YouTube, which I will get into. But yeah, what, what, what would you suggest? What, what do you... And trying to learn actually yeah, YouTube. YouTube um, as well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. It's in the ability to kind of see it as well as you know, as it as they're actually going through encoding it. And you know, not all YouTube creators are created equal. Yeah. Um but you know, ones where they're actually coding, you can watch them code, you can you can kind of visually see them using the engine, um, and, and using that to kind of get your feet wet. Um so definitely I was trying to find that there was a, uh, oh, it's drive me nuts. Um, Steven, well, I won't do it here. I'll try to pass that along to you as well for your audience. Um, but uh, he had a series of videos that are just mm. fantastic for you. Absolutely the best. Mm. Um, many of the, is kind of where we got our flocking behavior ideas from some of those where we started mm. learning how to do developing flocking so for those of you who don't know flocking is um, uh, mathematics for getting let's say birds fish schools of fish to interact and move through your environment um, and there's all sorts of rules that that define um, how close you know this bird is to this other bird and it moves them so that it looks fairly real as, as they kind of move around. They avoid each other, but not too far, and they kind of pull each other back in. And there's all this math involved in it. Um, and, and getting back to, you're not going to create any of this yourself. Like, right. you're going to, you know, more so than picking your own, I think, um, engine, it's finding resources that are good and that you trust and that, that work well for you to, to, piggyback off of really, really, really smart people. Um, you know, people that understand physics to a much larger degree than, than we will be able to. People understand, you know, calculus and, and these kind of mathematical problems. They've all been solved, you know. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> anything that you need is out there. Um, you need to develop the skills. I think that's probably like developing the skills to find it, you know, mm. in that needle in the haystack. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always say we stand on the shoulders of giants when it comes to yeah. game development. We're always kind of grabbing from whoever fixed it before us and whoever he grabbed it from the person that or them. Um, it's it, this industry. I mean, since since its conception, that's just how it's been. It's been handed down from one generation of developers to another generation of developers and continuing. Um, but I did. You mentioned a very good thing. It's like a really good segue for what I wanted to say about finding good resources um and it's the fact that the youtube videos right you said that not all youtube videos are created equally and it's so true because especially i don't know why with unreal i feel like it's just because of the visual scripting language that it, because of blueprints it just seems a lot more accessible than looking at code uh just code visually has that kind of barrier that people look at it and they just look confused and they don't want to touch it but unreal if kind you of, don't reread the language yeah, yeah unreal kind of brings in a bit more um kind of beginners and for that reason i have seen so many tutorials and you can verify if this is the same for unity or not i found so many tutorials that are very good to make a prototype they are not scalable they do not give mm. you the resources on how you can expand this expand this system and how to actually optimize it and make it work in an actual game not just a prototype that you can put together in a few minutes but there are tons of tutorials and again no shade to any youtube uh, creator out there but there are tutorials out there that just don't um, scratch the surface at all when it comes to how deep the information goes so at at some point you do need to dig uh, dig deep, deep for yourself and find these resources for how the system works or why it's put together this way so that you can optimize it and it you can build on top of it 
Yeah, I, I think that's, you're not going to find like probably one answer. You're going to, it's going to be an amalgamation of like 20 answers that you're going to then pull in for your particular, and, that, and part of what you're saying, it's, I agree with the, the prototype, you know, they're, they're just showing how to do, let's say flocking behavior, you know, again, we'll use that. Well, that's all that they're, they're just, they're just building, you know, a way to show you how to do that. They're not actually creating a game around flocking or using it necessarily for, for a particular game. And like you said, um, if, if we just used the, which was an excellent, excellent tutorial on flocking, um, that we came across and taught us kind of the, the math and, and, and what we needed to do to do it. But by no means were we going to just drop that in to our game and be done. Right. Um, it wouldn't like our game would come to a crashing halt. Like, yeah, we had to, we had to end up using all sorts of other technology in order to get, you know, thousands of, we have thousands of fish flying or, or birds flying around at all the times. And we have, you know, all this stuff going on. Um, the renderer would have just come to a grinding halt if we yeah. didn't understand, you know, how to use GPU instancing on top of that, and then be able to use threaded flocking where you, you have to run these things through multi-threaded behavior. You know, it's just, right. there's so much more to it. Um, and, and granted that that's, that's most people probably aren't going to have to deal with that. Um, especially as you start out. But you're right, you, you're not just also going to be able to just copy and paste this code directly into your your, your system and expect it to work. Um, mainly because it's it's not going to be exactly what you want anyways. Like, yeah. you, your game is your game. Your game has specific things that it needs to do um, that these things aren't just going to cover outside of the box. So keeping your scope small, definitely. Because I, yeah, as, I was it's just math. Say the, same the thing. smaller the scope, the less yeah. you have to worry about one adding stuff on top because the scope is small, and two optimizing because there's not a lot happening. In the yeah. Way. So and you but don't have also, to do that. Look at some of the best games out there have the smallest levels and um, right. simpler systems like Undertale, yeah. for example. But if you if you go in knowing, okay, I want this to be small. This is prototyping. This is just seeing what I can do or you know having a very small idea you're also kind of protecting yourself from that feature creep whereas if you go in with this giant idea you're kind of you're setting yourself up for failure honestly because you have the big idea you have all these things you want to put into it how do you pick and choose what actually gets added and how do you you know if you're not ready for it it's kind of like taking somebody and just throwing them into the deep end of the pool and saying good luck sorry you don't know how to swim Whereas realistically, you need to start in the shallow end and come in slowly and kind of build that up. I've always likened it to um, create video games in the same way that you play video games. When you start out in a video game, you're not starting out at level 20. You're starting out at level one, level zero, and you're gaining the skills that you need so that when you get to the end, you know what you're supposed to be doing. So it's really interesting for me seeing a lot of these game developers, like Rainy, <laughs> kind of being like, I want to start at the end and see, you know, what I can accomplish. And it's like, well, you're going to have problems. It's, um, you can also, you could liken it to any skill, really. There's a whole bunch of metaphors. You got to walk before you run. You got to, you know. Honestly, um, it's not a bad thing to do, but don't expect to game a game, get a game out like that. Yeah. If you just want to go ahead and explore some really crazy... If you want to go and go make for an it. MMO yeah. as your first yeah. game, amazing. You're going to learn so much. It's going to take you 15 years. Don't expect to release that <laughs> anytime soon. Yeah. It, it really it, uh, comes down to your intent and what you're trying to get out yeah. of game development. So, yeah, no. uh, I was, the only thing I was, I was going to kind of move on to, um, sort of what then are the risks you know, when you're when you're hopping into this with these engines, you know, what are some things that you need to look out for? One of them definitely being scope. I think hopping into Unreal or Unity, you kind of have this mentality of these are big engines, I need to make a big game, um, which isn't necessarily the case. No, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, certain engines, you know, game makers, they're going to be much more focused. You know, you, 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 you're what you have to deal with. It, it can just be overwhelming in unreal like i find yeah. unreal more overwhelming than say unity mm -hmm. um though that's 
just because it's it's what you're comfortable with and what you know yeah. um you know my background came from c sharp so to me you know dealing with c plus plus was just i don't want to do that um I'd much rather stay in my 4gl language versus then have to get barreled down into pointers and all that though blueprints mm. helps quite a bit yeah we don't touch the code at all it's all blueprints for us yeah so but i'm but i'm also a coder so i want to yeah. code. you know i it's yeah. i've been doing it 30 something years to me it's the second language you know it's, yeah well first language honestly i think i'm better at coding than i am talking <laughs> so you know that's that's that but um you get what you get with these engines though i mean i think that's the biggest thing is you know just being practical and this comes back to what rainy said earlier was um you you are going to have boundaries you know you have to work within the confines of what it is yes okay fine you you can build plugins and all that and it is very flexible and there's things but there's there are at some some point certain walls um yeah the other one is unity proved this to to the detriment of everybody and scared the bejeebas out of everybody yep. um which was well they also are a for-profit company and they can yep. do whatever the hell they want at any point unreal yep. just as well Similar as risks. unity as anyone yep. um, depending yep. on who becomes the ceo tomorrow yeah uh what their focus changes who they care about who they don't care about um you don't control that so you are ultimately at any engine's mercy they can all close up shop tomorrow okay so you know open source is a little bit more protected from that standpoint yeah. but also if nobody's running an open source project or yeah. worse everybody is running the open source project that, yeah. that has its own issues um so but to me that just becomes noise it's it's not so it's like i can't control it there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to write my own. Yeah. So I, I don't worry about it. You know, if it, if it happens, I mean, granted, we, we did get a bit nervous with, with what just recently happened, but it turned out for the best. It seemed like it's okay now. And everybody got fired. You should get fired for that. <laughs> um, yes. yep. but you know, and it, it actually was a nice thing. Um, it actually proved that we have a little bit more control than we think as developers. I mean, that was yeah. the interesting part of that. That was a ground movement of developers and people just standing up and going, no, nope. absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. And, yeah. and, and it works amazingly enough because you don't, you don't see that that often where it actually, you see it when we complain, but not that it's effective. I mean, Godot yeah. got as big as it did since the, the Unity because situation. Of that. Yeah, right. people moved on to it and then a lot more people started working on it and they were like oh yeah no i don't want to work on unity anymore i am yeah. going to we, full-time work on godot and make it better and now the engine is we know so much more. we know a few people who were making unity games who when all that happened completely pulled off and moved to godot and had to rebuild everything for their game just as kind of a protection for themselves so it's and to your point of what it showed us is that we do have a voice um I agree with you. I think that more than anything was kind of the positive of seeing all of the, specifically the indie developers, all standing up and going, and not absolutely just for Unity, not, for you're going to ruin engines, our... Because they all saw it as well. I mean, Unreal must have yeah. definitely seen him, but they were... Absolutely, yeah. do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, then and... who, knows, who knows who was talking, you know, yeah. you know, back there somewhere, because there's always a few. There is, we can squeeze, yeah. we can get a little bit more money, you know, some pencil yeah. pushers over there doing something. So that shut up that. So, you know, I think that was a good thing. I think the other big thing, as you mentioned, is the Godot thing, um, creating more com competition. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The other thing is creating more, because um, Unity is now better. Like Unity 6 will be better. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pushed them to get back and refocused on on developing the engine again, going, you know, we, we kind of lost focus uh, as to what we were supposed to be doing. So it's refocused then because now they have to compete again back, you know, with, with yeah. companies like, you know, Godot and raise them up. Uh, we need competition. So we want multiple engines. The idea of, uh, 
we don't want one engine. No. Why would we want that? We don't want one ring to rule them all and no. Exactly. Us, you know, I mean, in the yeah. advertising not... material, they always like one engine to do everything for you. No, that's not good. We want competition because no. otherwise that's going to be a monopoly. And honestly, right. that would be my advice to anybody who's looking at it, getting into this. Um, potentially to you guys too is try everything you know yeah while you're while you're getting started and you're kind of testing the waters to see what works best for you but it's definitely beneficial to learn multiple engines just as it's beneficial as an indie developer to learn multiple skills learn how to program learn how to do some art learn how to model learn how to animate um the more things you have to fall back on the more tools you have in your toolkit so that if something does happen in Unity, you can hop over to Unreal or you can hop over to Godot where you can try something else or, you know, learn a language so that you can maybe fiddle with making your own engine down the line. Um, it, as long as you're pursuing the creation of art, you should also be pursuing the knowledge of how to create the art. And, you know, it's, again, same thing happens in the movie I mean, industry. Look at Leonardo Nobody Vinci, stays... Right? Uh, well, yeah, he, but he dabbled in so many different areas, and he just yeah. had so many tools in his pockets. Yeah, it's just, you don't have to restrict yourself. Yeah, not that I would ever compare the two, but you could also look at Leonardo DiCaprio. You know, acting and getting behind the camera, and <laughs> you know, most people in Hollywood dabble in a few different things. Very few of them are just actors or just directors. You know, look at George Lucas, who's a writer and a director. You know, so even has a definitely. Game <laughs> yeah. yeah so um yeah tr you know don't limit yourself to you know just mastering one thing um you're, you're better off kind of trying everything out i think all right so um we're going to be wrapping up but uh before we do that um i wanted to uh hand it to you and say if you have any any last uh advice for people who are new in the industry or indies who are just looking for help or or just listen to us in pop. If you'd like to share anything before we finish the podcast, please go ahead. Yeah. Final words of wisdom. And also do uh, give uh, a pretty cool of a shout out once you're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I will. Um, I, I would say this, a, a scope creep. That's, you know, it's, it's punished us. It's punished <laughs> yes. you guys. It's the bane of everyone's existence. Yep. Um, pick your idea, figure out what the boundaries are and then stick to it as much as you possibly can. Yeah. um that's that's the death but it, honestly this is the death of every project it's 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 it doesn't matter what it is you know your movie you know you, yeah doesn't matter could be writing a book writing a movie writing whatever don't 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 let scope creep come in as much as you possibly can it's 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 the worst thing you can do um pick the engine that works for you and uh and above all if you're a game developer you better love it it's it's there's pretty much just about anything else you can think of is easier <laughs> to do than this um and this is this is coming from somebody who's done it for 30 years um programming building master systems out in the banking world and commercial real estate world there's i've never done anything harder and not even close like yeah. three four times harder like it, it's not it's not for the faint of heart um it's brutal on every level um so you better you better really enjoy doing it i think um and just um if you do then then great if you don't do it as a hobby just just try yeah. to enjoy it <laughs> don't turn it into a business because that creates a whole other nightmare you guys should do a good episode on that if you haven't um just the business side of oh we've done a few you're, actually you're, yeah gonna be looking at yeah. It's, yeah, we've it's we've done how to start your business and the legal ramifications of things and um, yeah, just the how to get started and all of that. And I, I think to your point, I think a lot of people who want to make games for a living don't realize how much of it is business. And the advice we always give everybody is. It, get a business person, get one person who's going to work with you, who's going to be your business person. Um, because if you, it's harder to focus on being creative if you also have to do all the business stuff. So yep. get a, a Sydney for your rainy 
so that somebody else can can shoulder all of that. So yeah, I think yeah. that's great advice. It's not an afterthought. And go no. wish list Critter Cove. Go yeah. wish list. Well, go wish list Sunnyside. Go wish list Ova Magica. Yeah. Um, you know, Critter Crops. Go find a cozy game. Go find a small indie game and go wish list it. You know, give support. Uh, yeah. The only way things get better, the only, you know, you have to support indie games because we're it's it's kind of like what happened with Unity and all that and Godot. Like without Godot pushing people, without these younger guys pushing people, you you get yeah. what you get. Like you're you're gonna get in the tenth series of some you know random movie over and over and over regurgitated. You're not gonna get anybody taking chances. Exactly. Um, but we can only take chances if if we get supported. Um, you know yeah. we need people support we need their understanding that you know we're small and we're we're trying yeah. and we're doing our best um and we'll get there in the end if you just keep supporting us and keep helping us and you do yeah. that by wish lists or purchasing a game or you know giving us that four lattes you know <laughs> yeah telling and your leave. friends leaving good reviews yeah. spreading the yeah. word yeah, and making I, content. Honestly, yeah. couldn't have couldn't have ended on a better note myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. If you want us to keep experimenting and making these games that Triple A's wouldn't, uh, then yeah, you gotta you gotta support your indies. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so with that, thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on this episode, Jason. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and oh, if you would you like much. to. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to listen to any more of these episodes, there's a playlist on the over that side, I think, uh, on YouTube where you can listen to it. Um, we're also on Spotify, iTunes, all the all the jazz. Um, we also have a Discord server down here, uh, discordgg sunnyside uh, At this point, we would usually say wish list inside, but you can purchase it. The game is out, so look. And yeah, go have a look at Critter Cove. Go have a look at Over Magica, Critter Crops, all these. All these lovely cozy games that we're friends with um and uh yeah these episodes we share them full length uh the how to indie series we share them full length but we also do um every every uh, every two weeks we also have an episode on the state of the industry uh those ones will have an extended version which you can listen to if you would like to support and that one is down. oh yeah, can on. i throw out one more thing yeah 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 uh our good, good friends um, at Crest, who made our water. If you love the water in Critter Cove, they just released 5.0 version up on the oh. Unity Asset Store. Go check it out. It's okay. fantastic. If you like water and you like the water you've seen that that we use, um, yeah, go support those guys. There, There's not just indie devs, there's also all the indie mod creators <laughs> yep. and all the guys who make plugins for all yep. of these things. Yep. I mean, we would be nothing guys. without Ultra Dynamic Sky. So yeah, yeah, all the shout out to that. Yeah, yeah. but Chris and, is going uh, into Fluid my Flux. list. Of... Yeah, Fluid yeah. Flux. Fluid Flux is who we use for our water, and um, yeah, and he's constantly updating it and, and putting out great work. So for for every indie game that you guys love, there's probably a couple plugins that are being used that are kind of the the heart and soul of the game in certain ways like backbone for us for you guys the backbones yeah so um yeah when you support us you support them too so go go give them some love awesome all right thank you again thank for listening you. to us and we'll see you in the next episode